Hello and welcome to day one of source code auditing for the penetration testing and vulnerability analysis class. My name is Brandon Edwards. I'll be teaching source code auditing. The agenda for today, um, we're going to cover the goals of, of an audit, how you're going to approach the audit, just some basic background information on source code auditing, try and give you a methodology uh, to approach an audit with to help you identify the key components which you are most interested in when auditing. We'll cover a few bug classes, basic memory corruption, some data type vulnerabilities that can lead to memory corruption, and then we'll show some tools that you can use, or that I like to use at least when auditing code. As an introduction, I'll give you some background. I've read lots of code, and I still do read lots of code, and I enjoy finding bugs. Bugs can be grown into exploits. Exploits let you own stuff. Developer souls go in the jar. So for today, this is day one of two. We'll only be covering scoping and, and targeting a large code base and then a few vulnerability classes. We'll get into some more, some other vulnerability classes in, in, in day two. Uh, so this is it's not the entirety. And hold out and wait for the, when those slides are published. The other thing to note is the vulnerabilities we'll be covering today are pretty much all C, C++ specific. I've decided to cover this because I feel as though memory corruption in C and C++ applications has been responsible for a great number of vulnerabilities that have had a huge impact on security, computer security in the last 15 to 20 years. These vulnerabilities have been around since the 80s. We, we saw them first publicly have a mass impact with the Morris worm, and since then, despite the problem being somewhat understood, it seems as though the, they continue to appear and affect uh, our day-to-day -day programming. So, what is source code auditing? This process of reading source code to find vulnerabilities. It's great for finding implementation bugs. In a previous class, we discussed how to find architecture bugs or how to review a design to find sort of logical faults in how an application might have been built from the ground up. We're approaching the, this portion of the audit as though the design was solid, the developers had good intentions, but that there may have been bugs in how they implemented this design, and that's our, that's our goal of auditing at this point. So we are looking for memory corruption or, or inline injection like SQL injection or file name manipulation or possibly even race conditions. This form of auditing complements a design review to give you sort of a robust way to, to attack and break an application if you're, if you're penetrate, penetration testing something. The problem with source code auditing at this level is it's very tedious. It's hard to estimate the time required and a thorough understanding of the language and the code base that you're looking at is absolutely, absolutely necessary as well as an understanding of, of the deployment operationally to understand what type of vulnerabilities will be exploitable or not exploitable. Methodology. There can be various reasons to audit code. If you're working for a vendor, for example, and you're auditing code to find as many vulnerabilities as possible, your goal is not to determine if they are exploitable, just that they could be exploitable to remove them from the code base to, to get the best coverage. However, for this class, we're going to take the approach that you want to find the easiest or best bug. That is one that's going to be easy to find, quick to write an exploit for, and most reliable. For the sake of offense, we want this because we don't care if there is some theoretical bug existing in some other case. We, we just want to find the quickest way in. The reason we need a methodology is because there's never enough time. You'll have a large, large code base. You could be on a timed engagement. Or the lifetime of the target data on the box that you're trying to exploit could, could be running out. To rephrase that, you can never have your zero day too soon. Since time is critical, it is also critical to have an attack plan. Here I use the term methodology to mean attack plan. So what is our methodology? Obviously we want to understand the, the application. We want to review the documentation and understand its purpose. We want to examine the attack surface. And from the attack surface, we want to identify target components where we're likely to find vulnerabilities. If you've done the design and operational review, the above is much easier. How can we go about targeting? Well, there's lots of ways to target. Traditional targeting, and if we've done the design review, we're going to have done things like identify sources of input, we're going to see where the application generates output, we're hopefully going to see the security mechanisms that were baked into the application from a design perspective, and we'll also know what the application does in its sort of workhorse mode. Does it do complex parsing? Does it handle protocols? What type of data management does it do? What is the real underlying purpose here? Once we've done the design review and operational review, these things should be pretty apparent to us. However, you don't always have access to those type of resources, and you may have to go about meta-targeting. Some of the meta-targeting techniques involve just quickly identifying comments in code, such as grepping around for, for things like fix me's or XXX, or anything that would indicate complexity or a misunderstanding by the developer. 
as these misunderstandings or the complexity may breed insecurity through implementation flaws. Another common thing is swearing or typos. Also, you may notice that old code may not be as likely to have been audited or had security in mind when it was written. You can see copyrights on code that was imported, taken from other libraries, etc. Another, another meta-targeting technique is to look for code that was checked in at inopportune times. You have to remember that developers that are writing this code are on a timeline. They've got products to ship, they've got limited budget and limited personnel. If you're able to find something, for example, that is checked in 2 a.m. near the date of shipping, it's probably rushed code. Also, you may want to examine other code that was checked in around the same time as a piece of code which you have already found a vulnerability in. This may be indicative of the same processes or bad practices that led to the initial vulnerability. You also may want to just search around for patterns from the first vulnerability if you are to find one, and you see where it's replicated. Or if you have a developer that has particularly bad practices or exhibits the propensity to create certain types of vulnerabilities, you may just want to track where they check in code to examine that. Grepping. Now, I don't like to endorse grepping, but it is important to use when auditing, especially when on a time time constraint. Uh, when you when you when under time constraints, uh, grep grep can be very handy, but it is not a golden unicorn. What it can help you for help you do is to find bad APIs and check to see if they're vulnerable. These are things like string copy that we'll get into, um, or malloc to see if they if they have any sort of arithmetic. And again, we'll discuss these type of vulnerabilities. You can find lots of potential bugs, but if you haven't traced your input, these potential bugs are, are useless or, or are only theoretical. Uh, the other problem is that you can find bugs in components that aren't even accessed or used. It can be painful to trace back to input, and you should really use grep within a confined context to ensure that you don't have these problems. It's also great for finding keywords to identify certain pieces of code. Maybe you want to find where they do authentication or deal with passwords, so you'll grep around for those words. They can help you do all sorts of things, um, but again, it's not a golden unicorn, and without a full understanding of the code, you're going to miss most of the awesome bugs. So, how do you get this thorough understanding? Well, you read the code. Reading can be frustrating, and is often, is often cloudy at first. So, to approach the reading, you want to, to identify components and to gain context for them, and by doing that, you read iteratively. You read through the code and try and gain some sort of understanding at a high level and then read through and become more granular until you start to understand each component individually. The trick here is to learn to skim the unimportant code. You can always return to a previously skimmed piece of code if it becomes relevant. It's a game of pattern matching. So you want to look around and you want to see the things that are generally indicative of bad coding practices. How do you see the important? You start to get an eye for things that, that become imp that important in code. For example, you'll see code that's moving or copying data around performing input or output, or doing other funny smelling things. The other thing that you want to be able to, to learn to do is to skim for things which are not important. There's lots of filler code which will not relate to the code that you're interested in. It can gain importance, but initially it does not require your attention. For example, most of the things that you can skim right off the bat include things like function prototypes, defined macros, hard-coded value assignment, or initial value assignment abstraction. That doesn't mean these are unimportant, not at all. These will, these will definitely be involved in any vulnerabilities that you find, but they require less detailed attention unless, it, unless a deeper understanding is gained of how the code uses them. Take the initial value assignment, for example. Failure to assign initial values to a variable can definitely introduce vulnerabilities. Here in this slide, you can see a doauth function that's presumably to do authentication. You can see that a check is performed that if the user is banned, the authentication flag is immediately set to zero, and that if authentication user returns successful, the authentication flag is set to one. After both of these if statements, the auth is returned. The auth flag is returned back to the caller. The thing is that the auth flag was never initialized and has the potential to contain a value that was previously on the stack as it is a stack declared variable. While this is a vulnerability, it is important to recognize that auditing and looking at every single value assignment of a variable initially will not necessarily find vulnerabilities and could be a large waste of time. If you do spot an uninitialized variable being used, jump on it. There's likelihood that there's a vulnerability there. But don't waste your time checking every, every variable here. Abstraction is another great example. You have a lot of potential for bugs. And there will definitely be misuses of it that lead to vulnerabilities. But the problem is the developers who like abstraction love abstraction. And so it's probably used in every possible place. That means that there's lots of objects that are abstracted, functions, other things that you probably won't want to read as it's all filler code. Instead, think about the patterns that the developer has in misusing abstraction and look for those instead. So what are some code auditing tools? There are lots of tools that aid in auditing. There's editors and highlighters that just help make the code readable and, and stand out. 
There's pattern matching tools, and there's grep, regex, other things. A lot of these are built into the editors. There are static analyzers, and the pen and pad. Now, I say the pen and pad jokingly, but you'll find this very useful when you're actually walking through loops and trying to iterate possible states of memory. Being able to write down a, a certain state or refer to something later on will become very useful. So what are some of these tools that are out there? I really like Vim. It's an extension of VI. Some people like Emacs, and I feel sorry for them. Other people use Notepad++, Source Navigator, or Eclipse if you're reading Java. There also exist commercial products. Visual Studio is fairly good. Understand and Source Insight are also good. I've have had many friends swear by these, however, I've not used them. But what's interesting about those tools is that they, they provide some interesting functionality beyond reading code itself. Now, there are static analysis tools. There are commercial tools like Fortify, Clockwork, and Coverity. These will often analyze the code looking for known bad patterns. Some of them do compilation steps to actually tokenize and, and sort of build out a syntax tree and, and follow the flow of the code. They can find lots of interesting vulnerabilities. But the problem is that they can also find lots of, of false positives and miss potential vulnerabilities. Actually, Halvar Flake presented at, at Infiltrate and made a point regarding this was, was very awesome. Uh, and I, I recommend reading his paper because he shows how the, while these tools can analyze code, they do not have the capacity that the human brain does to quickly visualize and identify a state problem. There are, there, there are free products as well that do analysis, such as the LLVM Clang Static Analyzer, Find Bugs, and RATS. Uh, RATS being more like a fancy pattern matching grep type tool for bad APIs. Find bugs more uh, a code quality tool, and the LLVM Clang Static Analyzer, while has potential, is still very young. So while the analyzers are cute, they will miss vulnerabilities and they'll have false positives. This is a problem because your time is limited, and if you spend the entirety of your time looking at false positives, you've wasted your ability and you've taken up the time you could be using your ODA to own your target. While this may be true, the other thing that they can help in is understanding the code base. If they're able to do things like call graphing or or identify where, where input enters the application and reaches a vulnerable function, there's definitely value there. That being said, they cannot replace the mind. So highlight editors and navigators are useful. Um, a lot of things that I like to look for when in any tool that I'm using is anything that lets me track where variables defined. Uh, a lot of basic tools like Source Navigator, for example, will do this type of stuff, as will Visual Studio. I mean, a lot of these, uh, they, they have some understanding of the code, but it's not as thorough as some of the static analysis tools. Uh, you want to be able to do things like find where a function is, is implemented, find where a function is used, uh, do function call graphing, and then just generic search or regex, the ability just to search a code base or look for certain patterns. It's very useful. Okay, implementation bugs. This is where the bling happens. What is an implementation bug? An implementation bug is a bug in how the code was implemented which can allow an attacker to cause the application to deviate from its design. Again, we're assuming that a design review has been conducted and that no flaws in the underlying design or architecture of the application were discovered. So what are the ways that the implementation of a proper design can introduce vulnerabilities? Well, you can have the failure to validate input. You can have the misuse or misunderstanding of an API. You can miscalculate during certain operations or fail to verify the result of an operation. And you can also have application state failures. Those are logical bugs in, in keeping track of the state to implement your design. Implementation bugs have notoriously affected complex code, uh, such as parsing of file formats and network protocols. A lot of times, the specs behind these protocols or file formats can be complex themselves or possibly unclear if not well documented, as well as lack of education behind the developer who implements the code can introduce implementation bugs. Another common problem is trusting or assuming the structure or validity of input. And fail to, failure to track relationships, such as object references, which can lead to those state conditions that we had discussed on the previous slide. So the first and arguably most potent, historically speaking, of implementation bugs that I'll be discussing is memory corruption. Memory corruption happens when the contents of a memory location are unintentionally modified due to programming errors. When the corrupted memory contents are used later in a computer program, it leads either to a program crash or strange and bizarre program behavior. That is a quote from Wikipedia. Now, program crash and strange program behavior is fancy developer babble for busticated and exploitable. It has been infamously responsible for vulnerabilities, memory corruption as. And to quote a mentor and friend of mine, there's no such thing as a crash or a denial of service. There are only vulnerabilities which you cannot exploit. While I will not say that all memory corruption vulnerabilities are exploitable, 
I will say that in my history of observing memory corruption bugs, time after time, and more times than I can count, I have seen a vulnerability which was proclaimed to be unexploitable, later exploited, or exploited in private by people who are very intelligent or had information beyond the initial analysis of the bug. So while you may find a vulnerability that is potentially difficult to exploit, does not mean it's impossible. Memory corruption I consider to be the classic implementation bug. Um, I'm sure there are implementation bugs before memory corruption. In fact, there have to have been. But I find that it is the, is the most historically badass in, in resulting in vulnerabilities and compromises. And it's been public since the 80s, yet we still see it today. So let's look at a basic example of memory corruption. On the screen here, we can see that there is a vulnerable function defined. We call it vuln function. It takes one argument, which is a pointer to a user string. Inside this function on the stack, we declare a buffer, a uh, char buff, uh, an array of 128. For some reason, this function decides that it wants to make a local copy, possibly to manipulate whatever data is inside of user string. So it performs string copy to buff from user string. The next comment of dots represents some sort of logic that happens, and then it returns. Now, immediately on this slide is, is a bug in that there's no value returned, and so a compiler should be throwing a, a bug warning here because it declares int, but let's ignore that for now. Let's just talk about the string copy function. How does this function work? Well, it performs a copy from a source string to a destination string, and a string here in the context of C is determined by a sequence of bytes terminated by a null byte. As you can see in the diagram, there's a sequence of A's, it's of unknown length, but eventually a null byte is found as represented in hex in the last portion of the diagram. In this example, the copy happens from for the source to the buffer byte by byte until that null byte is reached. Because there's nothing to delineate the length of the copy to the string copy other than the presence of the null byte, if the supplier of the string places the null byte at a length beyond the length of the buffer, it could overwrite the buffer, write beyond the buffer, and thus write over contents on the stack. This becomes a problem as we look at what other things are stored on the stack. Traditionally, in x86 with function prologs as, as defined by most compilers, used by most compilers, you will have things like the instruction pointer as well as the previous stack frame data stored when a function enters. In this case, if for some reason the null byte is at a much further place, such as an attacker supplying an overly long string, we'll see that we can write into buff, but we keep writing buff, and we write beyond buff such that we overwrite the other data stored on the stack. Control of this data can allow for taking control over the, the execution flow of the application. This is a trivial example. This is literally a textbook stack overflow, vanilla stack overflow. And while it's not so common in code, it is important to understand the concept. In this example, we show overwriting the stack. However, corruption of other memory regions, such as the heap or BSS, have often shown to be exploitable. It is not during this portion of the class that we'll be getting into that. More will be taught on these concepts later in the course by Dino Daisovi. So, lots of memory corruption can happen from these byte-by-byte -byte style copies. There are lots of APIs that will move data around like this. There, there's a long list of them um, and many different supported things and re-implementations. Examples include string copy, string cat for concatenation, uh, string printf, gets, the list goes on forever. It is important to recognize that string copy has been identified by developers, and while they are aware not to use it, that is not to say that they will not re-implement it in their own broken form. Here in this function, we can also we can see another homegrown implementation of string copy. This also takes char user string. It also declares a car buff of 128 on, on the stack. We set our pointers, uh, the destination to being buff, and the source being to the user string we are passed. And then we iterate through source. So long as the source pointer does not point to a null, we add the, we add the byte to the dest. This function is buggy in all sorts of ways, but it stands to represent a basic homegrown implementation of a string copy. So we know that unbounded data copying is bad. And we know there's newer, safer APIs that exist that allow developers to specify the amount of data to be copied. String copy is probably unlikely to be seen in modern code, at least in open source, but it's not completely impossible that you will find it. It's easy to grep around and find in audits, as are many of these bad APIs, so don't rule it out. And it doesn't take much of your time to find. Memory corruption from pointer loops copying data can still be found, so be careful to examine any pointer arithmetic or, or pointers dealing with strings any chance you see them. Just because safer APIs exist also does not mean that it is going to be used properly. Consider string end copy, for example. This is a bounded string copy function. It allows the developer to provide a size argument to the function to delineate the max length that will be copied. 
The thing is, though, the, the way that this function actually works is sometimes misunderstood. Because of this misunderstanding, the function can be misused. A really basic example of this would be string copy, string n copy into a buff from user string for the length of user string. This actually causes a couple bugs because this does not force null termination. And, uh, but it, it, other than the lack of null termination, it is effectively a string copy in the sense that it copies byte by byte. So the length argument inside of string n copy does not actually account for the null, null byte. If the amount of data to copy is greater than or equal to the size of the buffer that we're copying into, no null byte will be placed by this tier n copy. And remember, C string functions need there to be a null byte to know where the string ends. Later on, for example, code may be assuming that the string is only as long as the size of buff, when in reality, the string is as long as wherever the next null is in memory. This could be in an adjacent piece of memory the attacker controls, such as another buffer declared on the stack. This could result in memory corruption later when we trust that that length is only the size of buff. Other places we can see where the length argument can be abused or misunderstood are in copy and pasting. Let's say we declare multiple buffers and most of them are the same size but one of them isn't. A lot of times for the sake of time and to be quick, copy and paste will be used for, for similar functions and similar act actions. Here we can see that the string n copy to buff 3 is actually using the size of buff 1 as the previous two are. For buff 1 and buff 2 this is fine, however for 3 it is not as it is not as large as the prior two buffers. Lots of developers have learned to consider the size and the null byte by now. Still, sometimes confusion or forgetfulness will lead them to, to introduce vulnerabilities by not knowing which functions do what. You can find this in the string concatenation functions such as strcat. strncat is a length delimited version of string concatenation. This function appends a string from the source buffer to the destination buffer, adding to the end of an existing string that's in the destination buffer. So let's take a look at this example. Note that strncat size parameter does not account for data that's already in the destination buffer. So if we already have some data in here, for example, we, the first time that we use strncat is to copy in some static data. The second time, we copy in from a string that comes in as a function argument. Here, no account is made for the value or the data that's already inside the first buffer. So strncat wants to know how much space is left in the buffer, not the size of the buffer. This misunderstanding can introduce a vulnerability. As shown in this example, as there's already data in buff1, there's the potential to overwrite by several bytes, specifically the length of static data string there. Other common misunderstandings of size can happen with wide characters, such as wchart. To quote Wikipedia, under Win32, the wide card T is 16 bits wide and represents a UTF-16 code unit. On Unix-like systems, the wide card T is commonly 32 bits wide and represents a UTF-32 code unit. Consider this function multi-byte string to wide character string. Size miscalculations can happen here by not considering that size of returns the count of 8-bit cars and not W cars, and that the W car is larger than that. Look at this vuln function, for example. We have a wcart buff array of 256 elements on the stack. We then call multibyte string to wide character string to convert into buff from string for the size of buff minus one. The problem is that the size length that we've given uses size of. And size of is not what we need here. The argument for multibyte string to wide character string is the count of wide characters to write. It wants to know how many wide characters can be written. Wide characters are bigger than the bytes, which is used by size of to calculate the size. And so, for example, on Windows, where wcart is 16 bits, size of buff is really 512. The example code results in a copy of 511 wide characters into the destination buffer when it was only intended to be 255. Be aware of the types of strings used by the application and review how string functions are used. Never assume that just because the intent was made to be secure by using safer APIs or mindfulness of memory size that the code does not have bugs. Remember, these are implementation bugs. The developer is probably meant to be secure, so double check their math. Gripping around for string manipulation APIs can be a quick way to find pieces of code that may be of interest and always review the arithmetic used for size calculation for copying of strings. The next section we're going to get into is data types. Data types are fundamental to programming. They are used to represent in a specific binary format some sort of value or finite amount of data. 
They're often misunderstood or mishandled as there are certain intricacies to data types. Based on the assumptions made around data types and the misunderstanding, vulnerabilities can be introduced. For this section, we're going to assume x86, although the same concepts generally apply, the numbers used specifically here will only be for x86. As a basic data type refresher, let's take a look at some of the primitive data types. You have signed and unsigned cars, these are 8 bits. You have signed and unsigned shorts, 16 bits, and then signed and unsigned integers, 32 bits. Sometimes these will be redefined or renamed in various places to be more clear or have specific uses, such as size t, which represents an unsigned integer on most platforms, or sign size t, which is the signed equivalent. A little binary refresher, in case it's been a while since you've last had to engage in any sort of binary activity, we can see the 8 bits are broken down for this car, and in portions of the diagram you can see where certain bits are set and the values that they represent such as the 1 bit being set and the value being 1, or the 4 and the 16 bits being set and the value being 20. When all bits are set for this car, the value is 255. In a signed version of the same car, we can see that there is a signed bit in the diagram. Unsigned cars or unsigned data types are used only to represent positive values. Alternately, signed can represent negative values. Signed data types use the highest bit as the signed bit, reflecting how the value should be treated. When set, the sign bit reflects that the value is negative via 2's complement. By default, all primitive types are signed unless specifically declared unsigned. Here we see comparison of diagrams, uh, a comparative diagram similar to the last one showing with bit set and, and the relative value. In the case of the signed car, we see if the one bit is the only bit set, that the value is 1. If all bits other than the sign bit are set, the value is 127. If the sign bit is the only bit set, 2's complement is at play, the value is negative, and it's the largest, or rather, the smallest value that can be represented in the negative context, which here is negative 128. This value works down, based on other bits being set, potentially down to negative 1, if all bits are set inside of the signed car. What's interesting about this is how code becomes vulnerable when data types are used without consideration for the type's boundaries. For example, Integers can contain a finite amount of data based on their bit width, in this case 32 bits. Exceeding this amount of data will result in the integer wrapping. This phenomenon is often called an integer overflow. And while not unique to integers, all data type wrapping is often grouped into integer overflows. Let's go back to that unsigned 8-bit car example. What is the maximum value that we can see the 8-bit can represent here? With all bits set, that's 255. So what happens when you exceed this amount of data? If we look at this little code sample, we have unsigned car x equals 255. You can see the diagram representing all bits set. We add one, what happens? It wraps around to zero. A good way to think about this is similar to the dial that you would see on a odometer on a vehicle. When the odometer is beyond the scope or the range which it can handle, it wraps back around. Okay, so we understand that these data types can wrap. And for this context, I'm just gonna call them integers. Now what? Well, consider the following code sample. In the previous code samples, we saw that we had these statically declared buffers on the stack or possibly other memory regions, which, if, if used, may not account for the size that we need. Commonly, developers, to get around this, will have dynamically allocated buffers to make up for this. They'll dynamically allocate memory as they need it. In this example, a function getData takes a socket as an argument, presumably reads a length off the socket from the function getDataLen, and then uses that length to malloc that is, get dynamic, dynamically allocated memory from the heap. However, here, it looks as though the developer was very conscious and wanted to make sure they had enough memory to have that null byte, as we've seen not having that could be a problem. So what did they do? In the malloc, they pass the argument len plus one. After they've allocated the memory, they pass it to read, and they read in for the length. Now, let's ignore the fact that there's no check here to see if, if the allocation was successful, no null check, as the code would not fit on this slide otherwise. The code intends to have enough space plus one, potentially store a null byte. But if the network data supplied is the maximum integer possible, when one is added, that's going to wrap to zero. This means that the length passed to malloc is going to be zero, telling malloc to allocate zero bytes. Now malloc will never allocate zero bytes, but it will, it will return the smallest size of allocation which it knows how to do. In this case, this will definitely be an undersized buffer since the length which we will be using will be a very large integer which we use to wrap. This allows for the memory corruption during read. Pointers are also susceptible to wrapping, like other data types. The hint here is that pointers are secretly unsigned integers. 
Let's take a look at this function string stuff. It takes a socket argument, a buffer, and then a buff len. Let's say that the buffer and the buff len determine the buffer that was allocated and the length of the, was the, length of the buffer as it was passed to malloc. Inside the function, we have our own local argument max point, and we set that at being buffer plus buff len. This is a common practice to check, where if doing pointer arithmetic, a check will be performed to see if the current pointer is beyond max point. In this case, though, we could see that a data size is right off the network, possibly similar in the way to the previous function, and then we check to see if the current buffer pointer plus the data size is less than the maximum point which we have set. The problem is that if data size is too big, for example, if it were negative one as we, or all bits set, large four gig value, as we saw in the previous example, this would wrap it around. Other large values can do this, and so this check to see if buff plus data size is less than max point can be gamed by sending a value which is too large. Later on, this would lead to memory corruption inside the read when data size is passed to it as an argument. So what are some auditing tips for this? For all size calculation, especially that which is used for dynamic memory, you need to review this. Look at the pointer arithmetic that's used around size boundaries. Consider what the data types that they're using. A quick and dirty tip for finding integer overflows leading to memory corruption is to grep around for malloc and other allocation functions and to see if arithmetic is used inside the arguments. If not, see if there's a variable that's used for the argument and if arithmetic was used previously to calculate the value of that variable. So the question was, are integer overflows exhibited in other languages, such as Java? Yes, Java is susceptible to integer, over, integer overflows as it also uses a finite amount of space to, rep, space to represent integers, as does .NET. The behavior is not necessarily the same or, or as well understood possibly in, in .NET. Um, however, the behavior is there. Now it should be noted that it's unlikely that code written in Java or .NET that has integer overflows will introduce memory corruption as they're not using it to allocate memory in the same way C does. But if the logic is based on the values being within a certain range and you can wrap them, you may be able to influence the application and cause it to deviate. And that would still be considered an implementation bug. Thank you for your time today.